Welcome to this Beer with Nat mini-series. On every episode of Beer with Nat, I share a beer and a chat with people who do what they love for a living. But this mini-series is a little different. Instead of chatting with women who work in the beer industry, like I normally do, this time I'm chatting with women who don't. Why? To show that it's not just women who work in beer that love it. Over the next four episodes, I chat with an actress, archivist, podcaster, and broadcaster, not only about their careers and what it's like to do work that they love for a living, but why beer is their beverage of choice. Today's guest is Saoirse Monica Jackson, actress best known for her role as Erin Quinn in Dairy Girls. Saoirse tells us how she got into acting, the differences between working on stage and on screen, some of the things she wished she knew when she first got started, and the people who have helped her along the way. We also talk and taste our way through two different beers, as Saoirse tells us about what it was like to grow up in a pub as her parents ran one when she was younger, and what got her into beer. Saoirse is normally a light lager drinker, but she asked me to introduce her to some new styles, so I pulled together a few options, and we ended up tasting a unique Belgian beer style called a Creek. It's aged on sour cherries, so it's got a beautiful pink color and a sweet and sour flavor profile, followed by a pastry or dessert stout, which was flavored to taste like a chocolate fudge cake. You'll find out what she thinks of each shortly. Just a quick heads up, we recorded this episode way back in December 2019, back in the days when we could be in the same space and share a beer. The initial idea was to release this mini-series in April, but as you well know, life happened. So here we are, a little while later, but better late than never. Here's Saoirse. Cheers, Slancha, as they say in Ireland. Oh yeah, Slancha, very Slancha. nice. So I've brought for you today a cherry beer. It's from a brewery in Belgium called Boone. It's called Creek Boone. And it's quite an interesting style because it's a wild Belgian wheat beer. So what that means is in addition to regular brewer's yeast, they also use wild yeast and bacteria to make it slightly sour. And then they age the beer on sour cherries. So that's where it gets this nice sweet and sour flavor, the beautiful pink color, which no one can see, but we can see. And then that really full on cherry flavor as well. So it's not what most people think of as beer. Are it's you enjoying so, it? It's so, so nice. I think it would be a great beer for a hangover. It's sort of like <laughs> v- Vimto meets beer. The next morning. Yeah, the next morning. That sort of, I need some fruit juice to feel healthy, but you still need that little bit of alcohol. Yeah. And it's only 4%, so it's really a good easy po- drinking. post-mortem beer for the, for the day after a heavy night, but... It's delicious. It's so fresh as well. Yeah, and it just doesn't taste like beer. And yeah. I think that's why it's a good sort of gateway beer for people who are like, oh, lager, not for me. And you're like, oh, no, 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 there's a whole lot more. There's a whole lot more. Have that. you had kelpo? It's like a children's medicine. Oh, and, is it that cherry flavor? And it is so delicious. Everybody <laughs> loves kelpo, and you always want that extra extra spin when you're oh, younger and you're like shop, please, please mom some more and that's exactly what that's like You've it's so so flavor. nice yeah so it's bringing you back to childhood as i'm well. getting that cowpole kick yeah well we'll come back to your childhood <laughs> in a bit but first i want to talk about work and what you do for work so you're an actress your main role at the moment <laughs> is as erin quinn on dairy girls on channel four so take me back how did you get into acting and then how did you get to the role that you're in today um i remember my my parents have always been super supportive ex- especially my mom and when I was really, really young, I loved watching old movies with my grandparents um, and with my parents. And I was fascinated by th- theatre. And I said to my, asked my mum, could I do that for a job? And she was like, yeah, you could definitely be an actress and you get to keep all the clothes. So that was... <laughs> so sign me up. <laughs> sign me up. That was um, a massive incentive for me. And then obviously I find out in later years that that's not true. And then my me and my younger brother were being sent to speech and drama. And I loved it. And that was just it from there. Um, I had a great teacher at secondary school who's also really smart and I've just to be completely lucky um to be completely honest sorry I've just been completely lucky to be completely lucky yeah and so when you were first doing those acting classes and you were getting really into it when you were younger did you think this is what I want to do when I grow up yeah that's amazing to then actually make it happen yeah and I feel like that's such a privilege as well and it's definitely something that I feel again very lucky for that I never really had that struggle of wanted what I wanted to do and I always knew it was going to be hard Mm -hmm. and I always had the fear that it wouldn't happen but I always knew that that's what I wanted to do and I really never had a plan b which probably wasn't very sensible but thank (laughs) god if we're driving in one direction (laughs) exactly exactly and so then you did go to acting school is that right to help get a little bit more professional training yeah before then landing your first jobs yeah I didn't actually I was so um I was lacking knowledge in all the big drama schools in London which might have been a good thing and I just applied for loads of different places and Manchester the Arden School Theatre was one that really stuck out to me because it had a comedy module Mm. and I always was cast in drama and even when we were when we were at drama school I was always cast in the more 
the roles that leaned more heavy on the drama side and never the comedy roles but it was always something that interested me I never thought it was an avenue I would actually go down but and then from drama school a, this casting director came in and she was basically auditioning people for like one line and I kept getting called back in and called back in and the writer of this series called The Five on Sky One, Harden Coben, really gave me my first big break and wrote a part under the series for me and it's Mark Tondadai, the director, was just so good to me. I was still in drama school at the time and he really helped me out and he got an agent and I think, I hope that there's a point when I'm older and I'm at a, a more established point in my career that I can really give someone that help in hand that um, Mark Harden Coben, but mainly Mark Tondadai had done for me because it was amazing. Wow, and yeah. so it's just being in the right place at the right, right time, time and meeting the right these person. people. Yeah. yeah, oh my goodness, and then yeah. it's all just spiraled from there. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely been ups and downs, and as all actors, I've been out of work for seven months at a time or a few months here and there. But I know on the whole, I can never look back at that through gritted teeth or feel sorry for myself because I have been extremely lucky mm-hmm. as well. And I mean, for Jerry Girls to be written. It's just luck was on itself. Yeah, right. Thank Perfect God for timing. the birth of Lisa McGee. For a lady from Derry <laughs> exactly. to then get this role. And in comedy as well. Of course, yeah. there's elements of drama to it. Yeah. But that's quite interesting. So so what was your first role, the piece that was written for you? Was that more drama? That focused? was drama, yeah. Okay. Um, the Five was a story about people going missing and these cops um, on the hunt for them. And I played this young girl called Sasha, massive jump from Saoirse. <laughs> and uh, she'd been kidnapped while on holidays in England with her parents and she'd been missing for like 10 years. Um, oh. And then they find her then. So it was a nice little part. Nice okay, little drama I need part. to go look that up. That sounds good. <laughs> and then after that, w- you made your transition to... Theatre. Theatre, yeah. yeah. So what are some of the differences between being on stage and being on screen? And do you have a preference between the two? I didn't expect myself to be as nervous going into theatre and um, it was to play Curly's Wife and of Mice and Men and it was definitely a role that I always wanted to play when studying it at school. Yeah, that's a big part. Yeah, I mean, it, it was a real end, but it's such an important part. Part, yeah. important part. And I, um, I had this lovely director called Roxana Silbert and she really helped me and supported me to play Curly's Wife in, in a very different way that had been done before and really play that childlike quality of her instead of mm. playing her as a seducer. But... It was a nerve-wracking experience. Um, I don't know if there's one I prefer because I love the fact in theatre you get to play it in chronological order and you follow the story through in the right timeline. But um, I love that opportunity on film to go again and try it in different aspects mm-hmm. and to be able to fully watch someone else's performance and then decide what you're going to do off the back of that. And they both have their privileges, um, so I couldn't really decide. Um, but theatre is, is, is it's hard work like yeah maybe it's yeah. that thrill of sort of the live yeah. aspect of it yeah. you've got to get it right this time yeah. whereas in shooting you can do it multiple times yeah. you still got to get it right you still got it right that, then you can work with your colleagues a little bit more that sort of thing yeah yeah, I didn't think about those things so 2018 was a massive year for you <laughs> being on West End with the ferryman yeah and then having dairy girls come out on tv at the same time had you started working on both in 2017 and sort of were you prepared for both <laughs> things coming out at once in 2018 that sounds like such a big year for your career um it's actually such a funny story because the ferryman for me sort of came full circle they had already cast the ferryman and i was called down there's so many children in the show, mm-hmm. so they needed actors to come down and play the kids in their very long rehearsal process. I think it was like two months because it's such a massive phenomenon of a show. So I came down and played the kids. And then when I was on that job playing the kids in the rehearsal process, I found out I got Derry Gears, filmed my first season of Derry Gears, and then was asked to come and play Sheena then on the ferryman afterwards. So oh it was such a nice journey. Wow. Yeah. And all of these stories relate to Northern Ireland, yeah. which is quite interesting. <laughs> How does that feel? Are you like, am I being typecast? I can do other things. Or are you pleased to get to share the story of, you know, your home? Yeah, I just never actually expected to work in my own accent. Mm. I mean, I was always told at drama school to really work on my Dublin accent or to lean more towards that Belfast accent because these are the ones that we typically hear on TV, but... To work in a Jerry accent, yeah, it's, it's a privilege. Yeah, and, uh, you've been getting to do that for years. So yeah, I've got to, got to do that now on two jobs, so it's great. Yeah. On two jobs, it's brilliant. And how does that feel, having that sort of gap? At least you know when you're doing a play. Yeah. You prepare, you perform, that's it. Yeah. Does it feel strange sometimes to do your filming? And then What's let the it go. What's the normal gap, yeah, between filming and post-production? And you're like, oh yeah, I filmed that ages ago. And you forget about it. Yeah. yeah. And then you look at it and you're like, oh my God, I'm like five that years older. That was me, Yeah. <laughs> 
I would do that so differently now. Is there a typical sort of average amount of time that you wait or that totally depends on the production company and sort of the TV channel or wherever it ends up going? I mean, it does just vary. I think TV, the turnover can be so much quicker on it. So mm. um, they have their slots ready allocated of when that can come out. And yeah. a lot of the time when you're doing films, they're following the film festivals. Or, mm. um, I mean, once I do the work, I'm really not involved in it then. And I know so many things behind the scenes can get so complicated, but it can be anything from like six months to a year or over a year before something comes out. It depends like what elements are in the film and wow. everything else that's going on, getting clearance for music and yeah. all these things. So it's a, it's a long game and you can forget about it and then just before the run out run up before it comes out you're like oh my god I can't like, oh, I need you for publicity you're like what did I do <laughs> and were you prepared for any of this you know of course you knew you wanted to be an actress yeah. and wanted to do the work but understanding sort of the ins and outs of the industry did did you get any training or it's very much just learning on the job I feel like that's definitely something that a lot of these drama schools and a lot of courses are lacking as well preparing for people for what that life actually might be like the mm. ups and the downs and um, there should definitely be a class and telling t- um, telling students what everybody's role is on set from yeah. a runner right up to catering to right up to the directors and the producers because it is this village that makes this product happen. So um, I was definitely shell shocked my first ever time on set, but I love it and I love that world and I love that everybody's working together for the one picture and I feel like to be in an industry like this, everybody cares so so much and. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like you have had lots of people help you along the way that you're so, very happy to think yeah, and recognize yeah. and then that you want to pay that forward as well. Yeah. So if there is some young person who comes in on set who doesn't know what's going on, they're yeah. like, Okay, I can help get you to where I was. Yeah. I was there before. Yeah, and I was there before like a rabbit in headlights. Absolutely <laughs> shite myself, so. <laughs> so All right. Well let's have another beer and then we'll pick yeah. back up. All right, so for beer number two we're going we're having dessert. <laughs> So this is a milk stout. So Ooh, it's like beautiful. a traditional stout, like you mentioned, like Guinness. Of course, it's a dark beer, so it's going to have these dark chocolate and coffee flavors. Did you go for a stout because I was coming on? <laughs> Both being Irish, oh I God, think it's in our blood. Like so chocolatey. Yeah, so this one then has added milk sugar or lactose. Mm. So it kind of gives it a creamy body, a bit of sweetness, and then chocolate caramel fudge flavors. So mm. we're drinking Hammerton's City of Cake. A chocolate fudge cake stout. Ooh, oh, my, it smells like Rolos. Oh my god, I forgot about Rolos. There you go, a taste of childhood. That is really That's nice. Delicious. I really like this one. Are you normally a coffee drinker? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So what is that coffee? So that comes from the dark roasted malts, so there's no coffee added, but to give it that dark color, mm. they'll use a barley that's been roasted to a very high degree, and it kind of has the same flavors as coffee, because it almost goes up to the same temperatures as roasting coffee. It's, so it's really nice. Coffee, chocolate, sweet. Yeah, that's so good. That is really nice, isn't it? Amazing. Yeah, this is the first time for me to try this one as well. But this is quite a popular style at the moment, these sort of dessert stouts. This, of course, is quite sweet, so you wouldn't want to have a ton of it. Just like a dessert, you want to savor it and enjoy it. Yeah, it's full of flavor. So another good way to win over non-beer drinkers, I think, with something like this. Yeah, it really is, isn't it? Liquid dessert. Liquid dessert. Put it in a nice glass. It's a, a lovely drinking experience. I love your glassware for beers. It does make beer makes a, a huge very, difference. Yeah. Yeah, so we're drinking out of wine glasses currently, and I think it just, a lot of people associate beer with pints and with sort of a masculine look, but yeah. if you can put beer in, a right, in the right glass and just elevate the experience, then I think more people will start drinking it, so. Yeah, but I do love going out and pinting. Yeah, so yeah. What, are your, what are your go-to beers? This is, I'm so intrigued to come on today and have this chat with you because I'm such a basic bitch when it comes to beer and like I just like all the standards that you sort of grow up with at home like Coors Light and Cardsburg and I know you're looking at me now with sheer shame in your face. Not at all (laughs) you drink beer and that's why I wanted to have you on here because I think a lot of people either they avoid it or even if they do drink it it's this like secret they want to keep and not admit that they drink beer because it is often seen as something that's not feminine or you know not ladylike. I also wanted to speak to you because your parents used to run a pub when you were younger and so you've kind of grown up in this world of beer and pubs so what was that experience like having your parents run a pub and then do you think it shaped your perspective on beer and sort of drinking? Yeah that was a really really nice time in all of our lives and um, the pub and the B&B was in this beautiful part of Ireland and on the show in Greencastle. Was it just a seasonal thing? Did you guys go from Derry out to Donegal? 
Um, that was quite tricky at the time because we were being educated in the north before my two brothers moved schools actually down there. And okay. I always stayed being educated in Derry. Okay. Um, but it's only 20 minutes down the road. It's that mental thing at oh. home. Everybody in Ireland has a holiday home or a caravan 20 minutes down the road with yeah. the English just fine bonkers, which it actually is. <laughs> so we, it's by the sea. It makes all the it difference. It makes all the difference. Um, we had a holiday home down there and then my parents loved it my mum always wanted to get back into the hospitality industry she was a trained and a very very good chef so they ran it together and it was a really lovely experience growing up and calling in to see your parents on a Saturday when there's a wedding in and they had great show bands they played the John Quigley show band and it just was I think for me as well growing up around entertainment and Mm. socialising um was was amazing for me and I loved it. All the people that would come down on their holidays, we would play with them out in the park. It was it was just lovely. It really, really was lovely. And did that shape your perspective on, you know, oh, I see men drinking beer, women drinking beer, yeah. women are only drinking wine. Did you pick up on any of those sorts of things or were you just like, this is a great vibe, I want to be in the pub? Yeah, I suppose that was always just my norm. Yeah. Um, and my family from Jerry would have called down some Sundays and the Jacksons would have all had a, all had their roast Sunday dinner out the mm-hmm. back while my mum and dad was working and we would have sat with them. So it was definitely a really family feel. Mm-hmm. So I never really thought about it like that. But when it comes to drinking beer, I remember my ex-boyfriend coming over from England to Ireland and meeting my mum and being like it's so mad that your mum is such a sophisticated graceful woman but she goes out with your dad and drinks pints and I like never thought about it my mum's like don't you, ladies don't you chew gum but I'll have a course light <laughs> <laughs> I do like that yeah you know, I like it brings that. up a good point that's yeah. you know why does he have that perspective in his head oh yeah. your mom is so classy yeah so therefore she cannot drink a pint yeah so I think there's so much to unravel about those sort yeah. of expectations yeah and I don't know what it takes to be a woman to say oh I don't care what people think yeah. I want to drink it I don't but care there was a study on why women don't drink beer 17% of women drink beer regularly which means a beer once a week and the number three reason for women not choosing to drink beer was because they feel they're being judged by others so some people can get past that yeah. like if it's what I want to drink I'll drink it in whatever volume I want to drink it in yeah but other people can't get past that so I find it quite interesting and when I started drinking, my mum has always had a really great dialogue with me and my brothers about alcohol and how you handle drinking and what that means. And I remember when I first started drinking, she really tried to steer me away from spirits or even alcohol pops mm. with all those high sugars and really tried to say to me to drink beer instead because it's a more, obviously there's more mass mm-hmm. to it. So you can have the one for longer and there's just not as much chemicals and stuff in it and yeah, high sugar. Yeah, much lower alcohol, that yeah. sort of thing. Yeah. Interesting. So in your world you know when you're Saoirse at home and you'll go down and have a pint with your friends if you're at an awards show backstage and there's beer would you get the beer would you get the champagne we always actually laugh um when we go to award ceremonies um Louisa Harland who plays Orla when they Mm. get wine on the table we're always like why is there not more beer because you don't want this set with like red wine and have red wine lips or yeah. white wine because white wine's so dangerous you have like four glasses and you're at a work event you're like oh my god i need to go home i but, didn't think about that yeah. that look of having too much white yeah. wine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. but um bottled beer would always be if it was there i would never care about anybody else thought and i wouldn't care about standing in a ball ground drinking a bottle of beer mm-hmm. it really wouldn't bother me but um but the not option's there. not there it's not really there as much at those sort of events interesting and yeah do you think, of course that could just have to do with who they're going after for sponsors. Yeah. Do you think it is a sort of image thing that they're trying it, to give off? That wine and spirits and cocktails and champagne seem a bit more elevated than But it's just beer? a thing, isn't, isn't it? Do you not think, like, whenever you go to a wedding, when you sit down at the table, there'll always be two bottles of red and two bottles of white, and that will be everybody's free drink for mm-hmm. the night. It'll never be beer. Mm-hmm. Which is it's such a bad mistake at an Irish wedding, because, of course, everybody ends up hammered. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, haven't you learned anything? <laughs> You've got 16 cousins, surely you should get better at a wedding by now. <laughs> also, beer and food pairing, there's so many more interesting avenues to explore that a lot of people think it's just wine that should go and with that dinner. that is something that I would love to hear about because I would I would never go for a beer if I was eating. Yeah, even something, so like the first beer that we have, the cherry beer, it's really nice with like goat's cheese because it's got that same sort of sourness and it's really yeah. light. So then it kind of is like you're putting cherries on a salad with goat's cheese, yeah. that sort of thing. And then with the chocolate one, of course, chocolate on chocolate is kind of the usual route that yeah. most people go. And if you had that with a piece of cake, 
that was really rich and fudgy and then you just mm. instead of having milk to wash it down then you have the beer to wash it yeah. down it's a really nice combo really um, nice there's so much more that you can do in that space i need to have you around and i'll cook for you I'll do some <laughs> please beer and food beer. i would love that <laughs> i just did some beer and food cooking i made a dessert that has beer in it over the weekend and that was new for me to try and experiment so it's a chocolate mousse with beer oh delicious there's some in the fridge if you want to try i will be taking that home <laughs> we'll that sounds that great it's perfect and Let's what, see. sorry, I know I'm now interviewing you, what beers are not as high in calories? I know wine is more fattening than what beer is, but like what beer, what type of beers can you go for that I'm, don't give you that immediate bloated feeling that you can get sometimes? Yeah, people do always assume that beer is more fattening than wine. But it's not. Which it's not. Yeah. Neither beer nor wine actually contains any fat, but of course they both contain sugars and alcohol, which then contribute calories. Yeah. So... In terms of looking at something like a half pint of Guinness, that's 100 calories. And I think a lot of people think it is much more than that. People tend to automatically think, oh, the beer has the bubbles, the beer is filling. Yeah. But if you're having a small glass of wine that's around 13.5%, that's 100 calories as well. So they're actually pretty similar in terms of calorie content, but of course people tend to drink beer in much larger volumes than they do wine. Uh, so the calories tend to add up a bit more quickly with beer. That said, though, if you keep the serving size down, you will, of course, then keep the calorie count down, too. Yeah. And then in terms of picking a lower calorie beer option, one of the things adding calories to your beer is the alcohol. So keep it low in terms of ABV if you want something to have lower calories. Is it nowadays... such a novice? Is ABV oh, the percentage? Yes, alcohol okay, by volume. Okay. Yeah. So if you have a very strong beer, there are beers that are like 12% now, like a glass of wine. So the more alcohol, the more calories. And then with something like this one the milk stout we're drinking now, there is sugar added in there, so that is then more calories. So if you want something that is not as high in calories or not as fattening, then go for something that's lower alcohol and then that doesn't have added sugar. But most beer styles won't. Okay, good to know. So those are your recommendations. <laughs> <laughs> Regarding some of the things that we've talked about, about these perceptions around women in beer, is there anything you think we could do to help sort of shift those mindsets? Is it you turning up to an event with your own bottle of beer and saying, I want to have a beer tonight. You know, why is there no beer here as someone who has a bit more of a public eye on her? I think Are I there things we could do in that space? I definitely don't think I could take the risk of coming on class press with my own cow out and do a work event. But I mean, the sentiment is lovely. <laughs> your publicists are like, who is this girl now? Stop She's talking to her. Bag, She's giving her. you the worst ideas. <laughs> But I do, I think it's making it more versatile. I think the glassware and stuff makes it such a nice thing. And I think it really is the education on beer. A lot of these craft beers and stuff that are out now, I know definitely a lot of me and my friends, my female friends that um, enjoy going out and having a couple of pints will always stay clear of some of the craft beers that are out now because they're so dark and heavy and they mm. leave a really bad aftertaste in your mouth mm. and tend to repeat on you. Um, I think it's more education around beer and what, what are the best ones to do. Like the, these two are lovely and even though they're flavoured beers, they're still quite light mm -hmm. and don't leave that, leave that horrible aftertaste. So. Yeah, so it's about doing tastings and yep. kind of trying it in a safe space where if you yep. don't like it, you only have this much. You don't yep. feel like you just wasted six pounds at the pub exactly. and things like that. Yeah. Where it's, it's a thing with wine, isn't it? To try it first before you buy the bottle, but it's not a thing with beer to go, can I really just try it? It's not like a True. culture. Really, yeah. Yeah, or there will be some specialist craft beer bars you can do that. But yeah. if you're out and they only have bottles or cans, then yeah, yeah. you're not able to try it. So, yeah. okay, all ideas for things I need to do <laughs> to help get more more women drinking beer. Okay, so I'll ask you my last question. So normally on Beer with Now, I speak with women who work in the beer industry, not only to highlight each woman and what she does, but also just to showcase the opportunities in beer. So I wanted to ask, in your worlds of acting and film and television, it can also be quite male dominated. Mm -hmm. So are there other women that you want to shout out who are doing a great job supporting? women in your industry. I have just worked with the amazing Kate Nash on a film called Higher Grounds. Oh wow. And it was honestly like growing up listening to Kate's music I was such a fan and I don't know if you've ever listened to her music but oh. as like a 12 and 13 year old girl listening to Maida Bricks her first album I didn't really realise at the time but her music I did realise at the time and that's actually why I really loved it but it wasn't a conscious thought um, that I was doing it for that reason it's so it was so girl empowering and girl power and um, girls bringing each other up and working with her on that job just her moral compass and her sense of fairness and what's right and wrong and Kate was our lead and I was a supporting actor to her and just how she conducted herself in a set and how she treated everybody else and all the other projects that she's got going on and she's just had a music video that's came out recently um to her amazing new single called bad lieutenant and she has this young girl in her music video who unfortunately was born without 
in her hands and she's has these really cool absolutely cracker bionic hands and Kate has like helped direct this music video where this young girl is putting on her own makeup and it's oh, wow. just so beautiful and I just think across the board she's a great woman and a great example for young girls to look up to in her acting career and in her music career and I know this the industry that I am in tends to be such a boys club and looking up to the big CEOs a lot of the time they tend to, to be men, the head of networks or the head of channels and there definitely is too many male directors than there in comparison to female directors and especially writers, that's a big push. But I've been very lucky again to be surrounded by such amazing women. Lisa McGee, the writer and creator of Dairy Gears, has been fantastic to all of us and amazing. The head of Channel 4, Alex Mahan, is a really incredible, inspiring woman and I think as far as British television and British work goes, I mean, the rise of Olivia Coleman in the last few years and especially for me coming from comedy and now venturing into other things the shift in her career in the last couple of years and how she is as a person is a great inspiration for me so I feel like there's a long way to go but I'm so excited to be a young 26 year old woman this very moment to see all this going on around me and I feel privileged that I'm here now and I hope that it's better by the time the young 16 year old is 26. Mm. Yeah. Thanks so much for sharing a beer and sharing Thank your you. cat with me. Thank you. That was so lovely. Thanks again for your time, Zirsha. It's been so great to learn more about your career to date, and I can't wait to hear what you get up to in the future. I also hope I've helped you to discover a few new favorite beer styles too. Listeners, if you haven't yet watched Dairy Girls, be sure to check it out on Channel 4 or Netflix. I've also included a link in the episode description to the Kate Nash music video Searsha mentioned, along with one to the IMDb page for the upcoming film they're in together, so be sure to keep an eye out for that. Come on back next week to hear from archivist and beery Instagrammer Ellie King. Chat soon.